Flying easy jet, but uh, let's not finish. <laughs> okay, please go on. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I would like to continue today the discussion of uh, the response of Chern Simons quantum field theory to classical sources, the derivation of uh, anionic statistics and then uh, give you one modern generalization of a particle vortex duality in the presence of anionic vortices. That's my plan for today. Uh, for this course, I've planned, uh, I mean, much more. I wanted to get to non-abelian gauge theories and the uh, connection to QCD and domain walls in QCD. Uh, but anyway, there were so many uh, uh, good questions and intermediate discussions that uh, I, don't, I don't mind finishing just 50% of what I planned. So the action, I'll just write the action and then ask if there are any questions about yesterday. So J mu is a classical field, F mu nu is a fluctuating field, and the action from which this is derived, this is called the Chern-Simons action. Um, it's uh, given by mu nu rho, epsilon mu, d nu a rho, plus a j. Okay. J is classical. Okay, so we're going to analyze it a little bit today. It's a very fun system to study. It behaves in a very different fashion from electrodynamics. So now, are there any questions about yesterday uh, that were not yet discussed? Okay, so, so let's, let's, uh, let's uh, just understand uh, the response of the Chern-Simons gauge field to uh, electric charges, uh, let's say static electric charges. Action. Yeah, yeah, there is some minus sign. I'm, I'm being a little bit schematic here because it doesn't really, it's not going to really make a difference. So I was a little bit schematic. Thanks. Now, <clears throat> notice that the Bianchi identity, uh, which is a, a necessary property of the field strands, is uh, implemented here by the conservation equation for the classical source. So even though JMU is a classical source, it must obey the continuity equation. like any other classical source uh, in electromagnetism, it must obey the continuity equation, otherwise the system is inconsistent. Okay, so the, if you write these uh, equations in components, so, I mean, if you just write the mu equals to zero and mu not equal to zero components of this uh, relativistic um, equation of motion, what you find is that the, is that the magnetic field the magnetic field is given in terms of k over 2 pi b. This is given by the charge density. So that's a very weird response theory. You put electric charges, and instead of them generating electric fields, they uh, lead to a magnetic field, which is moreover linearly proportional to the charge density. So it's completely localized on where there are sources. Where there are no sources, there are no magnetic fields. And the response for the electric field is likewise weird. It's a it's going to be k over 2 pi epsilon ij eij equals, uh, equals ji j equals ji. So let me just talk a little bit about it because these equations are very important and they appeared in some uh, beautiful applications in physics. So first of all, as you remember, remember th there were also many discussions about it after my lecture. Uh, people asked about this additional term that I dropped. You remember that described the propagation, uh, which had two derivatives. So this term that I dropped had waves and actual propagation of electromagnetic fields. But now there is no more propagation. You see that the magnetic field and the electric field are, entire, are entirely fixed once you fix the classical sources. So there is no more, uh, there are no waves. 
And so, for instance, one interesting configuration to consider is uh, just time de independent distribution of electric charges of a unit charge. So I'm not going to write the uh, factor E here. It's just going to be a bunch of delta functions. And it's going to be time independent. So we're allowed to just put charges wherever we want. We stick them. Uh, and uh, let's say that all of the charges are positive. So the pictures that we have like are a two-dimensional space, and we just put charges. So what this equation implies, given that there is no current flowing, these charges are fixed, so there is no current, uh, it just implies that there is a magnetic field pointing in through each of these particles. So these electric charges became uh, solenoids. Okay? So what the chern simons term does is to dress each electric excitation with the magnetic field. It's a very weird phenomenon, uh, but that's what the chern simons term is about. So electric charges get dressed with this um, magnetic field, and this would be the source of the uh, different physics that we'll soon describe. Now, uh, I want to say some things about the term that we dropped. The term that we dropped was like an ordinary Maxwell type term. And so if I didn't drop it, of course, an electric charge would create an electric field. Because if k was 0, for instance, then this term that I dropped would be the most significant one. And that would lead to an ordinary electric field uh, emanating from a charged particle. But when we add the chern simons term, as I gave, gave you an exercise yesterday, when we add the chern simons term, the electric field gets a mass. So there are no more massless propagating degrees of freedom. And in fact, if you were to include this term, you can do it as a homework exercise. You'll find electric fields which quickly decay, exponentially decay. So the picture is that uh, it's, only, it's only true at long distances that what you see is this magnetic solenoid. At short distances, of course, you would see the usual response theory to, electro to charges. You would see some electric fields. But they propagate only over exponentially small distances, given by the scale of the mass of the massive spin one excitation that some of you worked out. Some people uh, told me that they worked out the propagator correctly, and it's, uh, it sounds good. OK. Now you can furthermore write down the formula for the electromagnetic field A. By the way, I've used the lowercase notations for the dynamical gauge field, so let me stick to that convention. I want to use lowercase notations. So. Uh, you can also write the formula for the, electric, for the vector potential, a mu. That's a, an easy little exercise. Uh, I'll just write the answer, and your job is to verify that it's correct. So uh, this is uh, going to be a sum. Let's, do, let's, let's write it down in the gauge where a0 zero is 0. So this is going to be a sum over epsilon ij xj minus x zero j over x j minus x zero j squared. Okay, so this is the vector potential. And it's very illuminating to try to prove that this vector potential is essentially a derivative of something. And you have to find what off. And so this means that this is almost a pure gauge, but it's not quite a pure gauge. Indeed, you're, you remember from uh, the, your grad, graduate courses that if you have a magnetic solenoid, the vector potential outside of the solenoid is pure gauge. But you cannot, it's not quite pure gauge. It's almost pure gauge. It's a singular pure gauge. You cannot get rid of the vector potential because there is some interesting holonomy, uh, the parallel around it. So this is almost a pure gauge, but it's not. You, you can almost write it as a derivative of something. You, you can try and see what, why it fails. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there is a, if you try to remove this gauge field by uh, a certain gauge transformation, then this gauge transformation would not be single valued. Precisely, very good. So this, uh, another way to say it is that there are, in fact, holonomies. So an interesting problem is to try to compute the holonomies around these charges. So the holonomies are given by exponentials of i integrals of a over some closed curves. 
this is the fundamental holonomy, but we can also define a more general holonomy where you put some integer n. Okay? Sir? Yes. Uh, wait, uh, here? X zero, I, I. Oh. There is no I here, of course. I made a small mess. N? That's right. So X zero. This one? Yeah, this is a, this is extremely, extremely bad. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the J's component. Uh, this should be a sum over the particles, so let's call this index P. And this is a, so there is another index P here, and this is a sum over the particles. Yeah, uh, thank you, yeah, this was completely butchered. This equation was completely butchered, unfortunately. Okay, uh, very good. So now I wanted to get uh, to just uh, mention the holonomies, and then uh, this is the gateway to understanding the fractional statistics. So the holonomies are very easy to compute. You have a gauge field configuration, which I, we already spelled out after uh, Atish has uh, uh, corrected the formula. So we have some gauge field configuration here, and we can take any closed curve, okay? and compute the holonomy. Now, because this system is abelian, the holonomy over every cl closed curve can be written as a simple sum over the holonomies of these uh, particles that are encompassed by the curve. That's generally not true. But in this case, uh, in this case everything is abelian and everything is easy. So you can just write it as a, as a sum or as a product of a single particle holonomies. So um, the answer that we find for uh, the, the answer that we find for W1 is going to be proportional to 1 over k. So let me just write it with the correct coefficients. We get e to the 2 pi i over k. So that's the crucial thing, uh, that there is a non-trivial holonomy around each fundamental charge. Now, of course, you could have chosen your charge distribution such that these particles such that these particles will have like charges Q. You could have put here a QI if you wanted. And then the holonomy would pick up a phase Q here. So that's obvious because everything is linear. Okay, so now let's get to the, uh, to the important thing, which is the, the statistics. And this is the key to the statistics. So let's draw this uh, picture again where we have these charges, which have a little magnetic field. I'm drawing this arrow, even though the magnetic field is a scalar field in two plus one dimensions. The magnetic field has no directions to go, but I'm still drawing an arrow. So now the quick question is, what happens to the wave function? Classically, of course, uh, this is all there is. There is some vector potential, there are some holonomies, and that's it. But quantum mechanically, it's interesting to ask, what happens when we take one of those uh, heavy probe particles around another one? There is a certain wave function, and we, uh, we can ask what happens to the wave function. So here one has to appeal to the Aharonov bond effect. Classically, this question uh, makes no, I mean, there is no interesting content in this question. Classically, when you drag particles around each other, nothing happens. Right? Because classically, this particle couldn't care less that there is a magnetic solenoid inside. But as you remember from in quantum mechanics, when there is a little magnetic solenoid, then uh, you pick up a phase. So Aronov and Bohm told us the answer. Aronov and Bohm found that if you take a particle of charge one and you drag it around some object, the phase that you pick is W1. So in general, Dragging a particle of charge n around uh, anything, okay, around anything, uh, gives phase, gives 
gives a run of bound phase, which is given by Wn. So to understand the phase, we have to compute first the holonomy around that particle. And that depends on the charge of this particle and the charge of that particle, which I've so far omitted. But let's call the charge of this particle n, and this is n prime. So therefore, the phase, the of bomb phase, will be, let's call it delta n n prime. This is going to be the of bomb phase when you drag one particle around another particle of charges n and n prime. So first, we need wn. wn is obtained by taking this formula and raising it to the nth power. But then we have to remember that now we're computing it around the charge n prime. So we have to also raise it to the power n prime. So we just get the previous phase multiplied by n n prime over k. And this is the, this is the important formula which we're going <laughs> now to utilize. Okay. So let, let me just explain what this formula means. So this is called braiding phase. And if you read the literature on topological field theories, this is called the braiding matrix or the braiding phase. This is one, some piece of the data that specifies topological filters, these braiding phases. So in abelian churn simon theory at level k, this, uh, this is the answer. But this has many, many interesting consequences. This is just the phase that the wave function picks. But there is now some consequences for statistics. You remember that if you have two fermions and you exchange their roles, you get a minus sign. If you have two bosons, then you get a plus sign. There are no phases in the wave function for symmetric fermions or bosons. But what about anions? Here we see that if we take an anion all around another anion, we get, we get this phase. But the spin of the particle is obtained from uh, essentially the same thing. The spin of the particle is the square root of this phase. Because for fermions, we exchange them. And for bosons, we exchange them. For fermions, we get minus 1. And for bosons, we get plus 1. So the, the square root of this phase is essentially the spin of the particle. So the spin of the particle is essentially the square root of the phase that you would get if you took the same particle around the same particle. So let's take n prime to be equal to n. We take the square root of this formula, and we get the spin. So the spin is n squared over the spin of the the spin of the particle anion with electric charge n is given now by n squared over 2k. Okay? So we find fractional spins. n is an integer. This is comment number one. That this leads to uh, intrinsic fractional spin. But that's allowed in two dimensions because the little group is u1 and its universal cover is r. So we are allowed to have fractional spin in two dimensions. So these uh, classical sources became anions. If you first quantize them, you see that they behave like anions. And there is interesting quantum mechanics problems associated to the many body, you know, Schrodinger equation for anions. There is a beautiful paper by Wilczek, Witten, and Wen, I think, uh, which discusses some, you know, hydrogen atom-like uh, problems for anions from the 90s. Okay, that's the first comment about statistics. The second comment is about how many anions do we, how many anions are there? And this is the, this is the point where the quantization of K comes into play. One may observe that if one shifts either N or N prime by an integer proportional to K, this cancels out. So this phase becomes trivial. Okay, so we see that if we uh, study uh, charged particles whose charge is a multiple of K, then they have no observable Aharon of bomb phases. And therefore, they make no impact on the low energy physics. So the low energy physics, namely the topological filter at low energies, doesn't have infinitely many anions. It only has finitely many anions, given by those which have a non-trivial phase with some other anion. Therefore, both n and n prime should be uh, defined modulo k. This is the first approximation to the answer. So we have finitely many anions, and that's essentially why k has to be quantized. The reason that k is quantized, at least in flat space, you would see some disease if k was not quantized, that there would be infinitely many anions. So if k is quantized, we have finitely many distinct 
finitely many distinct anions. Uh, well, it would, it, it's not obvious that this would lead to some disease. Uh, typically in, in uh, physical systems that you see in the lab, like in a quantum Hall effect, um, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. You see that there are finitely many anionic, like anion excitations, but it's not very clear why there would be a, a, a strict problem with you know, infinitely many anions, but there's one more step that I could explain which would show that, which is that if you try to compute the partition function of this topological field theory on a closed manifold, to get a finite answer, you need finitely many anions. It turns out that the Hilbert space on the torus is isomorphic to the space of anions. It's like an analog of radial quantization for topological field theories. So you get an infinite dimensional Hilbert space at zero degenerate, you know, you get infinitely many states of degenerate energy if there are infinitely many anions, which sounds like it's a sick system. Um, Okay, now I want to make this just a tiny bit more precise. The point is that the spin was defined as the square root of the phase. And therefore the spin is intrinsically only defined modulo one. Indeed, you cannot know the spin of an anion more than modulo one. If I tell you that the spin of some anion is one over six, there is no way for you to distinguish an anion of spin one over six from an anion of spin seven over six. Because if you measure our own of bomb phases, all you can get is the square root of the our own of bomb phase, and that's only defined modulo one. Indeed, these two anions could differ by just a normal particle, which is not anionic. You could take a spin a six anion, put on top of it some proton, which has spin, let's say, well, put on top of it a raw meson, which has spin one, and together they will give seven six. So you cannot distinguish by low energy measurements these two choices. You can only distinguish these two cases by actual experiments where you measure the spin. But by measuring uh, long distance uh, interference, like these kind of things, you cannot distinguish these two cases. And therefore this is defined only modulo one. So therefore there is a small subtlety uh, with the number of anions. There is a small distinction between even k and odd k. That's the last thing that I'm gonna say about it. For even k, we see that the anion with charge k is completely trivial. Its spin vanishes and its Aharon of bomb phases vanish. So for this case, there are k anions. Uh, for, this k, for, for this case, however, k2 plus z plus one, if we put n equals k, this is a half integer rather than an integer, and it still has some consequences at long distances. It means that you have a fermion at long distances, and it affects various observables, like what happens to the theory when you put it on, an, on a spin manifold. So here we have two k anions because you need to go to two k to completely trivialize everything. So the anion with uh, n equals k in this case is very interesting. It's completely transparent. It has no Aharon of bomb phases, as you can see from that formula, but it has a half integer spin. And you know such a particle, it's called the electron. The electron is a particle which has no Aharon of bomb phases, but it has a half integer spin. So if you look at the quantum Hall effect, Usually, for odd k, uh, this anion is called the electron. So that's how in the fractional quantum Hall effect, uh, people identify the electron. It's that transparent anion with n equals k, which looks like a transparent fermion. So if you look at Laughlin's wave function for k equals three, that's the electron. It's a very nice uh, fact that connects to this discussion. Yes, yes, there is also a, co a connection to knots. Can you repeat the question? One way to measure this braiding matrix abstractly is by considering Wilson loops for anions that they braid each other like this. There is like an abstract definition of this braiding matrix from the braiding of anions, from the Wilson loops of anions. Okay, so now I hope you got some intuition about what Chern Simon's terms do. They seemed like they completely gapped the system but they do not, they, leave some, they lead to some anions. Then there was a lot of work in the 90s on uh, first quantization of anions, where you just study a fixed number of anions, heavy anions moving in a box uh, with these finite phases and some potential. But the modern work is about the second quantization of anions, where we also allow anions to pop out from the vacuum. Yes?
Correct. Yes. If uh, if if uh, if uh, k if k was uh, in uh, in q, you would still get a fi finitely many anions. Um, well, in that, <coughs> it might seem okay from the discussion here, uh, but uh, one thing that I can tell you, which uh, I won't prove, is that the Hilbert space. I already said that in words, but I'll write it precisely for the record. So he, the Hilbert space on T2, if you put these anions in a, in a periodic box, the Hilbert space on T2 uh, has k states. That's true whether, or, whether k is even or odd. So this distinction makes, this, the Hilbert space on the torus does not see this transparent electron anion, or transparent electron. So the Hilbert space on T2 has k states. And uh, that's perhaps the easiest way to see that K must be quantized. Perhaps I should just say uh, one word on history. The fact that uh, K has to be quantized in non-abelian chern simon theories was appreciated from the get-go. Uh, the reason is that if you write a non-abelian chern simon action, there is a certain gauge transformation, which is called the large gauge transformation, which makes the action non-invariant unless K is quantized. So people have appreciated immediately that for the non-abelian case, K has to be quantized. But if you look all the way even to, into the 90s, there are still papers discussing the U1 case with fractional K. Because for the frac U1 case, there was no obvious disease with fractional K. And it's only like, I would say, in the mid 90s that these papers stopped appearing. People have understood that this makes really no sense. Because for U1, it's much, easy, it's, it's much harder to see that K must be quantized. And indeed, uh, like, perhaps this is one way to understand it. But if you just do experiments in infinite flat space, you don't see an immediate disease if you chose k to be fractional, as you said. Like if it's a rational number, it seems okay. So it's a, yeah, for you one, this quantization business is perhaps a, the most subtle one among all the cases. Okay, so now let's, are there any questions about the basics of uh, abelian churn simons theory? Okay. So now let me just tell you about the uh, more recent work on second quantization of that. Second quantization of anions. So this is the this is what you get if you try to uh, make these anions pop out from the vacuum. So let me do, let's do the simplest example now. So I'll do the simplest example. This, and I'm only going to do the case of a billion anions. So I'll do only a billion anions associated to a billion churn simons theory. There are generalizations in the literature by now uh, for far more complicated cases, but for pedagogical reasons, I'll just do this case. So we're gonna, you remember that we studied the gauged uh, complex scalar field H. We had a long discussion about the duality between the vortices and the particles in this model of the gauged complex scalar field H. But now we wanna, what we wanna do is to we wanna think about H the H field that's creating uh, anions rather than ordinary charged particles. So the way we're going to write an action is that we will have the kinetic term for H as before, and the gauge field is gonna be called A. So this is the notation for the covariant derivative. It's exactly as it was before. E A H is B plus I A H. So we have a kinetic term for H. Then we have uh, some potential for H, which I'll specify in a second. And then we have the gauge field part of the story, uh, which uh, involves, uh, as before, one over two G squared D mu uh, A nu minus D nu A mu squared. And now comes the new piece, which uh, we want to add. I over four pi 
a a epsilon mu nu rho a mu d nu a rho okay and this is the action now this is the model with k equals 1 so i'm now studying the simplest possible case uh, where k is equal to 1 in our in the terms of our previous notation now this may look uh, this may look stupid because one of the main points here was that when k is equal to 1, it's almost trivial. You see, when k is equal to 1, there are no interesting braiding phases. When k is equal to 1, all the spins are either integer or half integer. And if you remember the formula for the braiding phases, all of them vanish. Here it is. So when k is equal to 1, all the braiding phases are trivial. So it seems like we haven't actually introduced non-trivial anions yet. To introduce non-trivial anions, we would need to put a k some non-trivial non, non k, like k equals 2. But the point is that even with k equals 1, it's going to be interesting. Because even for k equals 1, there is still something going on, which I've emphasized here. That's why I told you about it. When k is 1, we, have, we don't have anions, but we can have one fermion. So in this, you should already figure out that somewhere here, there is going to be hiding a fermion. Even though there are no fermions in the Lagrangian, this term modifies some background, some charge one uh, first quantized particle into a fermion, even though it started its life as a boson. So you should already anticipate fermions appearing from this discussion. So strictly speaking, this model wouldn't have non-trivial anions, but it will have some surprise nonetheless, because uh, there is this fact that the charge particles with charge particle with electric charge one. Uh, when it's very heavy, when this field H is very heavy, it's going to behave effectively like a fermion due to the chern simons term. The person who first figured out that in the presence of a chern simons term, a, heavy, a boson can look like a fermion, which is essentially in this disc, is Polyakov. But Polyakov never discussed the second quantization. What Polyakov did was to say if H was a classical field, it creates effectively charge one particles, which are heavy and non-dynamical, and their statistics get transmuted, a la this discussion here. From the spin, you can see that the spin becomes a half. So as far as I know, the first person who realized that the spin gets modified from one or zero to a half uh, is, is Polyakov. But as I emphasize, he never studied the second quantization. He just made an observation about classical sources coupled to churn simons terms which is exactly what I discussed in the beginning of this lecture. Yes? I just can't hear. Yes? For k equals 1, it's already non-trivial. You're asking if there is a gap? You're asking if k equals, okay, you're asking uh, the following question, if I understand correctly. You're asking if U1 level 1 topological field theory is considered trivially gapped or not. Okay. I, since you asked, I'll just say two words about it. I didn't want to get into this discussion. So suppose you just have U1 level 1, a uh, churn Simon's action. So meaning, uh, there, suppose there was no H, but just these two pieces. The question is, what is the correct terminology for this model? Is it trivially gapped or not? The answer is the following. The answer is that this model has a fermion hidden in it. Even though there are no fermions in the Lagrangian, there is a hidden fermion because the transparent line is with fermionic statistics. So this model can be defined only on spaces which have spin structure from the get-go. But on those spaces, it's trivially gapped. So people think about this model as a as a trivially gapped SPT phase. That's the termina modern terminology. But one should remember that it cannot be put, it, it must be put only on spaces where the spin structure is chosen. So it's, a, it's called the fermionic SPT phase, if you want the precise terminology nowadays. So it's basically trivially gapped to first approximation, but one has to remember that there is a fermion. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so what do we do when we write Lagrangian? We immediately draw this axis of uh, m squared. 
right? That's our automatic reaction to Lagrangian, so where V of H is as before M twiddle squared, sorry, H squared plus lambda twiddle H to the four. So we always, always we analyze the weakly coupled limits. What are the weakly coupled limits? There is the huge positive mass squared and the huge negative mass squared. For huge positive mass squared, uh, the analysis is uh, already been done on the blackboard. Like what I did so far is essentially huge positive mass squared. So let's do it first. Huge positive m squared means we can integrate out h. H makes no difference. And what we get at low energies is this plus that. Okay, so at huge positive m squared, our effective field theory uh, at first sight has two pieces. We have a kinetic term. Uh, okay, we have a kinetic term f mu squared plus uh, one, over, one over four pi uh, a d a with this epsilon tensor. Now we can, this, this can be further simplified because uh, what did we find in the exercise from yesterday? We found that this leads to a massive photon. So we throw away the massive photon. It's not part of the low energy effective theory. So when we go to even lower energies, all we have is the Chern-Simons piece. So, this, so all we have eventually is just the Chern-Simons piece, which is A, D, A with this epsilon tensor. And as uh, the gentleman here remarked, uh, since there are no anions, it's just a free, there is just one uh, world line of a transparent fermion. This is really trivial. There are no anions. So this is a really, this is a trivial phase. So the effective field theory in this case, in this limit is really trivial because the level is one. But I want to remark about this, I want to make a remark about this. Uh, so at long distances there is really nothing in this model. But it's worth mentioning that the world line of the H field is a fermion. So the H field which is an electrically charged, uh, electrically charged field. Uh, the H field is a fermion. Even though it looks like a boson and there are no fermions in the original Lagrangian, the world line of H particles are fermions. So if you have two such things and you exchange their, if you have two such particles, H particles, and you exchange their roles, you get a minus one uh, factor in the wave function. So even though there is nothing at long distances, it's worth remembering that there is a massive fermion. So this model, in this phase, we really see just a massive fermion. There is nothing at long distances, but it seems like this model has a massive fermion somewhere in the spectrum. Now let's discuss uh, <coughs> the other limit. The other limit is also very rich in physics. In the other limit, uh, H wants to condense. And when H condenses, we have a Higgs mechanism. So here, the theory at long distances is most certainly trivial because A disappears, it gets a mass through the Higgs mechanism, and H disappears since it's eaten by the gauge field and the radial mode of H is like the ordinary Higgs particle. So everything is massive. So this is, of course, also trivial. But who can remind us uh, in the Higgs mechanism of the U1 particle vortex duality, what was the most important excitation? What was the name of the excitation in this phase that we studied in some detail? Which excitation did we see here? Somebody remember? Yeah, we, but we didn't call them monopoles. How did we call them? Magnetic vortices. Because, yeah, monopoles is reserved for three plus one dimensions. Very good. So here, the most important excitation was a magnetic <laughs> vortex. So I want to tell you something about the magnetic vortices in this phase. The magnetic vortices in this phase are very interesting. And they behave slightly differently from the magnetic vortices that we've encountered in particle vortex duality. So remember the magnetic vortices, how did it work? We looked at the Stuckelberg action, which is the effective action, so to speak, at long distances at the Higgs phase. So the Lagrangian, was a, let's say that H, we wrote H as absolute value of H times E to the I Psi. That was our no notation for H. 
And then we wrote an action that looked like d psi plus i a uh, squared. This was our Stuckelberg action. And then I told you that you can then create vortices where psi has some vorticity around some uh, point, which is the core of the vortex. And to cancel the energy at long distances, we adjust the gauge field A to be 1 over R. And that's how we create finite energy localized magnetic vortices, approximately localized magnetic vortices. But here there is a small twist, an interesting twist in this story, because the action for A also has a chern simons piece. And it turns out that it makes a difference for the vortices. So, so there is another piece that we need to write, which is this, A, D, A. So actually many people got interested in uh, the properties of vortices in the presence of chern simons terms, and by now there is pretty extensive literature about it. I'll give you references at the end. So as an, a very nice homework exercise, which is not entirely trivial, but easily doable if you think about it, is to understand something, a, a small fact about these vortices in the presence of chern simons terms. So a small fact about these vortices in the presence of chern simons terms is that they have a fermion zero mode. Well, more precisely, they turn into fermionic particles. They have a spin a half. So, I, don't, I didn't mean to say literally a fermion zero mode. What I meant to say is that uh, when you compute the angular momentum of this vortex, without the churn simons term, you find zero. And with the churn simons term, you find that it has a spin a half. Because the churn simons term leads to some uh, electric, electric fields, so to speak, near the vortex. So this is a very nice fact that is easy to establish by yourself. You can just look for the solution, uh, compute the angular momentum, and you'll find that it is exactly a half. So it's not an anion, but it's a fermion. So the magnetic vortex becomes a fermion. Furthermore, you can do a slightly more precise computation. You can, turn, it, you can compute the spin. The spin is defined modulo 1 in chern simons theory. But as I told you, in the full microscopic theory, you can compute the spin precisely, because the spin is just the eigenvalue under rotations. Because now you have the full microscopic model, so you can compute the spin exactly, not just mod 1. So here, the spin of this H field can be computed exactly, and it turns out that in some convention, it's a half. And in the same convention, this is minus a half. So this, this is spin minus a half. And this is a half. So there must be a phase transition. This is a, an interesting example, because both phases were trivially gapped. And if you were Lando and Ginzburg in the 50s, you would say, OK, we have two trivially gapped phases. There is no phase transition. But that's incorrect. Here, the fermion excitation has spin a half, and here it has spin minus a half. And a half and minus a half are not the same. This is the eigenvalue under rotations in two dimensions. So there must be a phase transition. There is a mathematically more precise way to say that there must be a phase transition if you know about SPT phases. But I'm not going to explain that here. So there must be some phase transition. As I said, there is another way to prove that there must be a phase transition, but I won't explain it here. Now the question to the audience, those who have never seen it before. We have a model where there is a spin a half object, particle on one side, a spin minus a half particle on the other side, and there is a phase transition. Does anybody know a model which has a massive fermion on one side, a massive fermion on the other side, and the spin goes from a half to minus a half? Did everybody, anybody ever see such a model? Exactly. So this is just a free fermion. Let me just show you how it works. So the idea is that this phase transition is dual to a free fermion. Very good. Very good guess. So let me show you how it works. So consider the model of a single complex fermion. A single complex fermion in 2 plus 1 dimensions. This is the model for a single complex, uh, I think Dirac, it will be called Dirac fermion 
in two plus one dimensions. For positive mass, for positive mass, we have one heavy excitation in the system, in the Fox space, which is a single fermion, and it has spin a half. For small, for negative mass, it has spin minus a half. There's still one spa state in the Fox space. It has either spin a half or minus a half. And at m equals zero, we have a second order phase transition. Second order phase transition. So the idea is that here, the fermion becomes massless. So this is a free fermion. This is a striking prediction. When, if people can ever simulate this model on the lattice, they should see the scaling exponents of free field theory, namely of a free fermion theory. <laughs> and they should see that out of this Lagrangian, which had no fermions from the get-go, uh, there pops out a fermion, an effective excitation, which is the fermion. And we see that this fermion can be viewed in two different ways. We can think about this fermion either as coming from the world lines of the electric, electrically charged particle, H, so we can think about H as, as if it became like a fermion. Or we can think about this fermion as a magnetic vortex that became a fermion due to the chern simons piece. So this is a story about second quantization, not about first quantization. Because here we have the full Fox space of a free fermion, not just one fermion. Yes? OK. Yes? What you the? You are asking if H is a fermion? Yeah, you said that uh, H, is, H is a fermion. Well, in massive phase, of course, near the phase transition, H is very complicated. It's no, fluctuating. In massive phase, to begin with, uh, H uh, could preserve like a transform as a scalar under the Lorentz group. Correct. But No, so, well, so, okay, so we have to write the dictionary. That's what I'm gonna do now. H, strictly speaking, as we discussed, is not well defined. H is gauge variant, okay? So H has to be attached to a Wilson line. It's like a probe particle with charge one electrically. But as I told you, if you have an electric charge one, it also obtains a small magnetic field due to the chern simons piece. So now this is like the H particle, right? Our H particle started its life as an electric, electrically charged particle, but now it became like a little solenoid because of the uh, chern simons piece. So even though H is in the, as it appears in the Lagrangian, it's a boson, when you take it around, it, like when you interchange these two H's, you get a minus sign. <coughs> but H is not a well-defined uh, gauge invariant operator, yet it leads to a particle in the Hilbert space that looks like a fermion. I'll write the dictionary now more explicitly. So, so I'll, I'll write the dictionary here between these two models. So here we have the U1 gauge theory plus H, that's level one, turn Simon's piece. And here we have a free fermion. I want to write a dictionary <laughs> akin to what we've been doing for the other case. So this is like a new particle vortex type duality, but it's much more surprising than the previous one. It's even more surprising than the previous one because it's a boson fermion duality. So this is like a bosonization duality in two plus one dimensions. Boson, fermion, duality, two plus one dimensions. You might have heard about bosonization in one plus one dimensions, and this is a generalization to two plus one. So let's write the dictionary. Here in this model, what are the global symmetries? Maybe some audience participation 
which global symmetries exist in this side of the duality. It's the same as in the previous case. That's a hint. What was the symmetry in the gauged uh, model in the previous case? Does anybody remember? Yes, very good. There is the magnetic symmetry. So on this side of the duality, we have the U1 magnetic symmetry, which acts on monopole operators and on magnetic vortices. And the current is just epsilon mu nu rho, F nu rho, with a 2 pi. On the fermion side, what is the symmetry? What is the symmetry of a free fermion? Particle number, yeah. Fermion number. So it's just psi dagger, gamma mu, psi. And you can check, check that it's conserved. It's just the ordinary U1 symmetry. Uh, it's just the ordinary U1 uh, particle number symmetry. So the symmetries match. The phases match. And an interesting element in the dictionary is what does H squared map to? So when we change the mass on the, this side of the duality, on the fermionic side of the duality, we change this mass. So therefore, H squared maps to psi dagger psi. Okay, that's another element in the dictionary. Perhaps the most interesting element in the dictionary is to ask, what does psi map to? Somebody already asked that. What does the elementary fermion operator map to on the other side of the duality? Can somebody guess? Uh, not e to the i h. e to the i h is not well defined. So, okay, so let's not confuse. The magnetic vortex is a particle that is created from the vacuum by some operator. So psi is an operator, so not a particle. It's true that the fermion particle is mapped to the magnetic vortex particle. But now we're asking about the operator map. So what is the operator that creates magnetic vortices from the vacuum in the Higgs phase? No, H times the Wilson line would not create a magnetic vortex. H times the Wilson line is not a local operator. Psi is a local operator. It's a genuine gauge invariant local operator. So you're looking for some operator that would create a magnetic vortices. No, a Wilson loop is not a local. Notice a hint. This operator is charged under the U1. So on this side of the duality, the corresponding local operator should be charged under the magnetic U1. So which operators are charged under the magnetic U1? Monopoles, good. So this is the monopole. You see that this map is extremely non-local. The fermion maps to the monopole on this side of the duality, and the fermion bilinear maps to H squared. And you can continue a little bit the dictionary. You can say that fermion excitations in the Fox space map to either H Wilson lines or magnetic vortices, depending on the phase, and so on. So we understand, we can continue this uh, map a little bit in more detail than what I said here. So this is the simplest example of how boson-fermion duality arises. And this is a particularly trivial example because there are no anions here. So in this system, there are no anions. It's just a, a free fermion. And the free fermion doesn't have any anions. It's just a massive spin one excitation, a spin a half excitation. So <clears throat> uh, now uh, I could, I, I don't want to start a new subject. So I'll just say go for, if there are any additional questions for the last five minutes. Uh, if somebody wants to just, yeah. About which limit? The the limit. And Twiddle squared. Yes. yes. Uh, yes. Right. So if you are, you see, I in this uh, story here, I slightly deviated from the philosophy of these lectures. The f philosophy was to look always at very long distances and ignore all the massive stuff. So in this model, if you looked at very long distances, both in the huge m twiddle squared phase and in the huge negative m twiddle squared phase, there is nothing. It's trivial both here and here. So you would see no signal of a phase transition. That's except, okay. That's the, that's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is that even if you look at very long distances, there is something more sophisticated that you can do to detect the phase transition. But I did not explain that fact, that, that additional thing you can do. So it's, at first sight, it seems that there is no phase transition. So for this reason, in this, in this example, 
I also considered, let's say, the first non-trivial state in the Hilbert space to try to understand its quantum numbers. Okay, so I deviated a little bit from the philosophy. So let's do it again. At huge positive m twiddle squared, the gauge field uh, is the gauge field is unhixed, and it's massive because we have a churn simons mass. So what is the smallest? What is the simplest excitation in this theory? There is one excitation that is just the spin one, uh, the spin one gauge field. That's what we explained yesterday. That A becomes massive, and it's a spin one massive excitation. That's one excitation in the Hilbert space. I could edit here. In the in the fermion description, that would be maybe some fermion bilinear of spin one. Okay, you could see it on the other side of the description. But the more interesting excitation on this side, on this part of the phase diagram, is that since now the gauge field is massive. You remember this logarithmic divergence due to the insertion of one particle? That doesn't happen here because the gauge field is massive, so this logarithmic tail goes away. And therefore, it makes sense to ask what happens to the H uh, particle. Now, the H particle, even though it's not gauge invariant, H is not gauge invariant, the H particle is, is okay. It's like QED in 3 plus 1, there is an electron. Because now there is no long range tail, and uh, it's a finite energy configuration. And that H particle is like an electrically charged particle. But because of the churn simons piece, it obtains a small magnetic flux. And it looks like a fermion. So we can claim with some confidence, at least at large m squared, we can say it with full confidence, that in the Hilbert space, there is a spin a half particle. And on this side, we have to analyze vortices and convince ourselves that they have spin a half. So I deviated a little bit from the logic, but it was in order to convince you that there is a phase transition. Because here in the Hilbert space, there is a spin a half, and here is minus a half. So it cannot change continuously. And since there is this phase transition, then we just guess that it's a free fermion. Sort of made sense. One can scrutinize this uh, guess much more. One can compute various discrete anomalies and various things, and everything works. So uh, this, this guess can be really put on much more solid grounds by do doing additional, more sophisticated computations. Any other questions? Yes. So since they are trivially gapped, if you took a big, non big, uh, the big manifold, there will be no, uh, there will be just one vacuum. There is no topological filter here at long distances. But the model does require a spin structure. So say if you wanted to compute the partition function on a big, big torus, you have to specify the spin structure. Because you see that there is a hidden fermion here. And once you do that, you'll find always one ground state. And Okay, so this is a very, very deep and good question. Uh, maybe I can explain the question to everybody. The question is that you're asking, you're saying that this model is bosonic. It has no fermions. So in order to put it on some non-trivial three-dimensional space, I don't need to choose a spin structure. Well, on this side of the correspondence, it seems that we need to choose a spin structure because we have a manifest fermion. So we need to say if it's periodic or anti-periodic over cycles, right? So the question is, how is this contradiction settled? So this contradiction is settled in two ways. There is the less advanced way to understand why it's okay, and there is the more advanced way. So let me tell you both points of view, which are very important. If you ever dive into this literature, you'll see that this is a very important like, piece of the discussion. Of how is this even consistent? Can I remind you how it works in two dimensions? In two dimensions, there is a famous duality between the two-dimensional Ising model and the free fermion, that's on Sager. How does it work in two dimensions? In two dimensions, this manifest does not require the choice of a spin structure, and this does. The way, it's, the way it works in two dimensions is that in th this is not a free fermion. The duality of on Sager was not between Ising 2 and the free fermion, it was a free fermion where you also spam, sum over all the spin st structures. So here you are instructed to sum over all the spin structures. 
So when you compare partition functions, on one side you take some manifold and you don't care about the spin structures. On the other side, you sum over all of them. So that's one way in which this can be resolved. Maybe on the fermionic side, we have to sum over all the spin structures. So now what happens in two plus one dimensions is kind of similar. What happens in two plus one dimensions is that there are two points of view. One is that this churn simons action, since, uh, the, since it has a transparent fermion, if you look at the original papers in mathematics on this churn simons action, you'll see that this requires a spin structure. So even to write this Lagrangian on three manifolds, you need to choose a spin structure because this, uh, this particular object is not globally gauge invariant on non-spin manifolds, so to speak. That's one point of view. So you could say that both sides require a choice of spin structure. But in fact, the better point of view is like this. It turns out that you can choose this gauge field to be rather than a U1 gauge field, you can choose it to be a, a spin C gauge field. You know what's a spin C gauge field? Okay. A spin C gauge field is a gauge field which allows you to sum over the spin structures. So you can choose this gauge field to, uh, to include the sum over the spin structures. And then, uh, well, uh, perhaps I'll just stick to the first point of view, which is simpler to explain, because I don't, I don't want to explain spin C now. So the first point of view, which is simpler, is that, uh, in fact, uh, in an implicit fashion, both sides require a choice of a spin structure, because on this side, there is a level one churn simons term, which requires a choice of a spin structure, because it's not well-defined on manifolds without it. And this side manifestly requires a choice of a spin structure. So it's not entirely analogous to two dimensions, but using spin C structures, you can make it more analogously. You can make it look more like in two dimensions. Yeah. In case of free fermions, the theory is like parity invariant, right? Means uh, the one side. Right. But we see that in the left hand side, the current is not parity invariant since there's. Yeah, it's a very good, another excellent, really deep question. Indeed, this model, a free fermion, is clearly parity invariant. And also, I should say that the mass term breaks parity. So a positive mass and negative mass are related by a parity transformation, which you can see from the spectrum of the Fox space. Spin goes, a half goes to minus a half. While this model does not have parity symmetry in the Lagrangian. If you look at the Lagrangian, it doesn't have any sort of parity because the sign here is plus and not minus. So another fact about this duality, which I didn't even mention, is that at long distances, this model acquires an accidental parity symmetry. So even though you start from a microscopic model which has no parity, at long distances, everything becomes parity invariant, approximately. So this is an instance of an emergent time reversal symmetry. So this model has an emergent time reversal symmetry at long distances. And this is a, a crucial fact about this model. And it's also quite a common phenomenon that you start from a model that has no symmetry, but it acquires a symmetry at long distances. This also shows that this duality cannot be exact. It must be only a property of the long distance theory around the phase transition, because there is no exact parity symmetry in the bosonic model. It's only a long distance property of the model. So that's why the duality only holds, oh, sorry. That's why the duality only holds in some vicinity of the phase transition. Any additional questions? Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, in the fermion case, if it's massive, no? In the, at the quantum level, you get uh, parity breaking, no? You get the chen simons term. Uh, for Wait. Uh, you're asking about the free fermion? Yeah, the massive free fermion. If you, it doesn't have parity at the quantum level, no? It's if just a free field theory. It's like this. This is just free field theory. It, this model with non-zero mass, it describes a free fermion in two plus one dimensions. Yeah, I know, but if you couple to... I didn't couple it. In okay. this duality, we don't couple it to anything. Okay. The claim is that the complicated the bosonic model is dual to a free fermion with a mass. That's it. So once you add the mass, it's clearly not parity invariant. But at the massless point, it is. That means that the bosonic model near the phase transition acquires a newly found uh, time reversal symmetry. Uh, since we are out of time, but uh, this last uh, lecture of Zora, I, I allow for one more question, if any. 
yeah. Yeah. This is the last opportunity to ask something. <laughs> uh, if, if we consider a quiver gauge theory with another U1, but with another Church Simon's term, but with minus one level, we have a, an accidental Z2 symmetry if we exchange it to right. gauge, the, uh, gauge fields. So how can we interpret this in symmetry on the fermionic side? Well, this would be a completely different model to analyze. You're asking what happens if I have uh, two U1 gauge groups, maybe some matter that is charged under the two U1 gauge groups, and I take the levels to be one and minus one. So what you're saying is that since one and minus one are related by time reversal and there is some accidental time reversal, maybe there will be an accidental exchange symmetry. This is a set of interesting conjectures, but you have to try to write down the model, try to find the duality and see if it works. I believe that the concrete model you're asking about hasn't been studied, at least not that I remember. So yeah, I mean, if you have this intuition, you can try to work it out. Uh, the, um, okay, I wanted to give like one minute some references, and that's it. Uh, so, if you want to look at references about particle vortex duality, it, doesn't, it includes some part of what I said. Uh, it does not include some other part of what I explained. Um, it, it's just a subset of, what, of the things that we discussed. Uh, there are nice lecture notes by David, uh, by David Tong. Uh, they're free online on his website. And they cover a few of the things that I said and some of the computations that uh, you may need to do uh, to fill the gaps. Recently, there was also a small uh, review that came out by uh, condensed matter people. So it will be from a completely different point of view, emphasizing the connections to the quant fractional quantum Hall effect and to quantum phase transitions and deconfined criticality. That was by Metlitsky et al. So you can read a little bit about that uh, in that review. So these are two reviews about particle vortex duality and generalizations thereof. And hopefully in the future there will be some reviews by, from a more high energy perspective, uh, which will also include more material, but at the moment there aren't any other. There aren't any. Maybe some people will write some reviews. So this is about particle vortex duality. Now about the connection, to, well, I, in the first lecture, I gave you a little bit of material about a uh, young Mills theory. About four dimensional young Mills theory. I gave you a little bit about, of material about domain walls in young Mills theory and how churn simons terms arise on domain walls. And I haven't actually explained the connection to, to all this stuff. I haven't had time. But if you want to read about it, uh, you can look. I mean, there is no review, but you can try to read some literature, which, uh, uh, which you can get all the references that you need, and, all, and also looking at the references to that, to, to that paper, you can find all, all, all that's, that, that you would need to, to get into the subject. Uh, so you could start from uh, the paper of Gaiotto, Cyberg, and myself. So just look at all the references and all the citations to this paper, and uh, there is quite a bit of literature, but there is unfortunately no, no review yet of that story and the connection to this particle vortex duality. But you could look uh, from that. You could start from that. And yeah, so one may hope that in the future there will be a more comprehensive review of the subject written from a high energy physics point of view. Okay, so this is it. Let's thank uh, Zor for this uh, beautiful set of lectures.